Hello everyone, my name is John. I'm one of the lecturers at St. Paul's Theological College. It's a real pleasure to be with you today, wherever you might be tuning in from. Today's reading is taken from John 11, to which we now turn. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to Jesus and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. If you spent some time reading the Bible, you might have noticed some things that are, to say the least, unusual, or for lack of a better word, just plain weird. Here I have in mind things like the beating of Balaam's donkey and the suing nonchalant conversation the prophet had with the animal, the plagues of Egypt, bodies of water being turned to blood, the frogs, flies, boils, or perhaps even a man swallowed by and living in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, which of course foreshadows maybe the strangest and most mysterious thing there is in the Bible, the Son of God dying and then rising from the dead. These are examples of things which I think we can all agree are quite obviously out of the ordinary. But then there are some things in Scripture which only begin to seem odd when we start to reflect on them. And Jesus weeping in John 11, I think, is one of these things. When we look at the context and verses surrounding this passage, it's not really the reaction one would expect from Christ. And given what we know about the story, it may even appear inappropriate. Let's turn to some of these verses to see why this is the case. In verse 4, But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And in verse 11, After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. And in verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he will rise again in the last day. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Simply put, I think there is strong evidence here to say that it looks very much like Jesus knows all along what is going to happen in the upcoming chain of events. In verse 4, Jesus states that Lazarus' illness does not lead to death. In verse 11, using the metaphor of sleep for death, Jesus says, I'm going to wake Lazarus up. In verses 23 onwards, in his conversation with Martha, he tells her plainly, your brother will rise again. Despite the misunderstanding of those around him whom he was speaking to, Jesus was not being very subtle. And after resurrecting Lazarus, he says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he already knows what he is going to do. He knows Lazarus isn't going to stay dead for very long because he's going to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. But if that's the case, and he knows all of this, why does he weep? Why would he even be sad? There are some debates in the contemporary theological literature surrounding the doctrine of Christology, which is the doctrine of Christ, regarding what Jesus knows in the capacity of his divinity versus what he knows in the capacity of his humanity. 
For example, in the capacity of God, the word understands Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc square, and he knows what it was like to create the heavens and the earth out of nothing. But Jesus, in the capacity of a first century Jew, doesn't have access to this knowledge. But here, this isn't the case. Christ, in the capacity of his humanity, clearly knows what is up. When my brother Andy and I were growing up, our parents enjoyed, rather sadistically you might think, putting us through what I have come to call the reverse letdown. Or if you're being charitable, you might say they helped us enjoy a full range of emotions within a very short period of time. What is this reverse letdown? Well, here's an example. In the lead up to Christmas many years ago, I had spent a good few months fixated on the latest cutting edge breakthrough in modern computing, 32-bit processor, 8 megabyte cartridge capacity, 64 simultaneous colors, and a whopping 64 kilobytes of RAM. The Sega Genesis, the pinnacle of video gaming. Unsurprisingly, and much to the frustration of my parents, I spent every day for six months asking for one. But come December 25th, I rushed down to open the presents under the tree and found only socks and pajamas. Needless to say, a meltdown of Chernobylian scale ensues. But sure enough, though it seems all was lost, as the dust and the tears settled, my parents would casually reach into the cupboard and pull out a wrapped box of roughly the right size. And lo and behold, it was that which in the whole world, at that time of course, I most deeply desired. Now here I am not in any way trying to compare the unparalleled grief of losing a loved one to the lack of Sonic the Hedgehog on Christmas. But the basic underlying premise is this. If my parents began to join in and weep with me in my childhood sadness over not getting what I wanted for Christmas, you would think they were absolutely insane. Because you know that they know that very shortly they're about to turn their son's sadness into pure joy. And so we ask ourselves, would this not be the case many times over for Jesus? He knows very soon he is literally going to turn weeping into dancing. Some scholars argue that one aspect of Jesus' grief can be construed as a response to the unbelief he witnesses. And given the theme of unbelief in John's Gospel, this is very plausible. But the actions of Jesus in John also tend to have various levels of meaning, so we can postulate other reasons for his weeping. Here I want to explore three implications of verse 35 and what we might learn. The first is that Jesus' weeping teaches us to have compassion for those who grieve. The church father Augustine of Hippo writes, Wherefore did Christ weep but to teach men to weep? In weeping, Jesus shows his solidarity with the mourners. At SPTC, one of the emphases we have in our studies is to take a contextual approach to theology. We try and take serious the different questions that may arise from specific social cultural contexts. And within at least two common cultures we are exposed to, there is a tendency to sometimes be dismissive about sorrow or lament. The cultures I have in mind here are the Chinese, and perhaps ironically, Christian culture also. With respect to the former, in a recent published study, the evidence suggests that expression of emotion is carefully regulated out of concern for its capacity to disrupt group harmony and status hierarchies. This behavior is likely to be found in other groups that share cultural characteristics with the Chinese. We might find ourselves suppressing or underplaying how we feel as not to draw attention to ourselves or upset the status quo. As for Christians, we can sometimes fall into the trap of overemphasizing the triumphalistic turn. This idea that because our suffering is temporary, we ought to focus on the hard work Christ has already done, on what he's achieved. He's won the victory. Why are we wasting our effort mourning? Or worse, to believe that to mourn is to be in some way ungrateful. But Christ turns this understanding on its head by showing us that he unites with us in our grief. Jesus gives us some insight as to how we might balance this eschatological tension we see running through the Gospels. Simply put, this is the idea of the now and not yet. Yes, the kingdom has come, but there's still some dimension of it which hasn't yet been realized. And in the face of that, anger, mourning, and lament, as Jesus shows us, is not an unreasonable response. In fact, a view of the world without lament is a view of the world which is not complete. Our relationship with God cannot be without its possibility. As the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann has argued in his seminal paper, The Costly Loss of Lament, he writes, One loss that results from the absence of lament is the loss of genuine covenant interaction, 
because the second party to the covenant has become voiceless or has a voice that is permitted to speak only praise and doxology. Where the capacity to initiate lament is absent, one is only left with praise. The absence of lament makes religion of coercive obedience the only possibility. In addition to this, the second loss caused by the absence of lament is the stifling of the question of theodicy. The question of why is there suffering if God is both all-powerful and all-loving? Hard issues of justice are improper questions to pose at the throne because the throne seems to be only a place of praise. Thus, lament allows for a proper engagement of the suffering we witness on earth. Analogously, in arguing for the existence of the soul, the British philosopher of religion, Richard Swinburne, put forward a thought experiment. He said, if one day there was a supercomputer that was so advanced that it knew the position of every molecule and subatomic particle in real time and could model the universe, there would still be something incomplete about its description of reality, namely that it would not contain any of the information about the mental life of all conscious beings, of thoughts, of conscious experience, and so on. Likewise, the description of the Christian reality is incomplete without the possibility of lament. Secondly, Jesus' weeping, among other things, demonstrates his full humanity, which is, of course, the leading emphasis in John's Gospel. He assumes a human nature, taking on our very human attributes. He shares in our condition. He is tired, he gets hungry, and he even dies. Alcuin of York writes, He weeps because he was the fountain of pity. He wept in his human nature for him whom he was able to raise again by his divine. With respect to the former point, it is precisely Jesus' full humanity that allows him to accomplish his work on the cross. The Cappadocian father, Gregory Nazianzus, wrote, For that which he has not assumed, he has not healed, but that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. The Lazarus story in John 11 therefore points us to Jesus' complete identification with human beings like us. His own motivation to embody humanity as the King of the Jews and death to redeem all who believe in him and are baptized into his death. The raising of Lazarus also strengthens his faith that his own life will not end when he dies on the cross. The death of Lazarus therefore motivates Jesus to endure the cross so that no woman, child, or man should ever suffer bereavement without hope again. And one day death and mourning and crying and pain will be gone forever. We see then the Father preparing and motivating the Son for the Passion and are pointed to the cross and resurrection. So all disciples must tenaciously hold to his redeeming death and the resurrection that points to eternal life guaranteed by the gift of the Spirit. Lastly, in his weeping, we see Christ taking seriously the reality of death itself. The tears Christ sheds in verse 35 are actual but quiet tears. In the Greek, the word is used to mean weep silently. But before that, in verse 33, we read that Jesus groaned in the spirit. Some commentators have pointed out that the original meaning of the root word is to snort as of horses. It can be interpreted as an expression of disturbance of the mind, vehement agitation, or righteous indignation. What was it that made Jesus so overcome with emotion that he snorted like a horse? His was a deep anger which can be described as one that drives a man to fight for justice at great cost. When Jesus saw his friends Mary and Martha crying with the terrifying prospect of unprotected widowhood in a violent, controlling, patriarchal society, he snorted like a horse. And in the greatest sense, the anger of Jesus was a response to the plight of humanity fallen into sin. Never was this God's will for humanity. As alluded to earlier, Christ's weeping highlights an eschatological theme, the now and the not yet. The kingdom has come, but is to come. And the scenario in John 11 is a microcosm of this eschatological reality which mirrors our own. Christ is about to raise Lazarus, but he hasn't yet. Thus, the grief he feels is real and utterly justified. Even though joy is promised, it is yet to come. On reflecting on the tragic and premature death of his own son, the American philosopher and theologian Nicholas Waltersdorf sheds some light on this tension. He says, Someone said, I hope you're learning to live at peace with Eric's death. Peace, shalom, salam. Shalom is the fullness of life in all dimensions. Shalom is dwelling in justice and delight with God, with neighbor, with oneself in nature. Death is shalom's mortal enemy. Death is demonic. We cannot live at peace with death. 
When the writer of Revelation spoke of that day of shalom, he did not say that on that day we would live at peace with death. He said that on that day there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. In assuming a nature that was like ours in all ways except sin, Jesus gently sits beside us on humanity's mourning bench. Not only was he the perfect human, but to us he was also the perfect example. Of all people, Jesus could have dismissed Mary and Martha's tears. Do you know what I'm about to do? Why are you crying? I'm about to raise Lazarus. But instead, he draws near to them as he draws near to us in our condition. And so one question might be, how do we deal with grief, with hardship, knowing that the kingdom of God has come, but is yet to come? Thankfully, Jesus models this for us, and it is something that we have to hold in tension, much like the tension at the heart of the Incarnation, a being who is both fully God and fully man. We are able to weep for what is, but at the same time, rejoice for what is to come and what will inevitably be, the death of death through what Jesus has done on the cross. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, comfort those who grieve and teach us to draw near to those who are mourning. Make us joyful in the ascension of your Son, Jesus Christ, and may we follow him into the new creation, for his resurrection and ascension is our joy and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.